Hello, everyone. I'm Yuval Levin. I'm Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this book discussion with Leon Kantz about his wonderful new book, Founding God's Nation, Reading Exodus. Leon Kass is an emeritus scholar here at AEI. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Chicago, and he's now also the Dean of the Faculty at Shalem College in Jerusalem, where he's helping to recruit and develop teachers for that extraordinary institution. But he is maybe above all, a teacher of human flourishing, a scholar who for decades has led grateful readers and students toward a deeper understanding of what our full humanity entails and what the great traditions of the West can teach us about it. He is, I should also say, my teacher and mentor. I was privileged to be his student at the University of Chicago two decades ago, and have very much remained his student ever since. So maybe I'm not an objective observer, but objective observers are overrated anyway. And I can tell you that some immersion, not only in his books and essays, but in his approach to human questions, to the challenges involved in being good people and good citizens, could really do our society a lot of good. This book, which is a much anticipated follow-up to his wonderful book on Genesis, really puts all of that on display. It's an extraordinary achievement with a lot to teach us. And I'm very glad that we could get together at least virtually to discuss it here. Our format is very simple. The two of us will talk about the book for a while, both digging into its teaching a little bit and stepping back to think about what it offers us now. And then we'll take your questions and bring you into the conversation. There are two ways that you can pose a question, by email or through Twitter. You can email Ella Rader, whose address is Ella, e -L -L -A dot Rader, R-E-I-D-E-R, -E at AEI.org, and just send her your question. Or you can tweet it at us using the hashtag AEI Reading Exodus. Either way, please send your questions along as they come to you. You don't have to wait until we start the question period. We'll gather those and ask them when the time comes. And so with that, Leon, thank you very much for joining us. And really, thank you for this wonderful book. Yuval, thank you very much for the kind words. Thank you for making this event possible. Uh, I have to say that to be in conversation with you about this book is a special treat for me because you were part of several study groups which contributed to my learning. Um, as in the Genesis book, you're quoted very often for the many things I've learned for you. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be able to talk with you now that uh, the book is out and we can see what we can make of it together. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. And there are of course many places that we could start such a conversation, but before really diving in, maybe I should start with what's almost a silly question. Why should we read Exodus? A, a book like yours is the product of many years of work and thought and engagement, living with the book of Exodus for a decade and more. Why did you take it up? Well, partly I took it up because I'd spent 20 years uh, teaching and thinking about the book of Genesis, which led to the uh, book, The Beginning of Wisdom, which is in fact the outgrowth of teaching. And partly I simply wanted to see what happened next um, and to see how the project begun in Genesis uh, where um, God tries to get a foothold in the human world for a way of life that would avoid the disasters and miseries and evils of human life uninstructed uh, the picture of which we get in the first 11 chapters of Genesis before he starts up with Abraham. Uh, in Genesis, we see this, this new way begun on the plane of families barely surviving through the three patriarchal generations. But now in Exodus, we have uh, children of Israel starting out in Egypt, an incipient nation. And the question is, um, what will happen to them? How will this little group of families uh, become a people? And um, what will it take to make a people a people? What will uh, hold them together? What will define them? Um, what will govern their and guide their lives? To what will they look up? And uh, not only historically speaking, um, but also because reading these texts philosophically for their wisdom, I suspect that, that in reading this, I might learn something really about uh, a good life and a good com and a just community, something about freedom and law, something about justice and holiness, something really about uh, the human purposes and a life well lived. Uh, I, I thought I would get it. I, I learned something about it from reading Genesis. I thought I would get a lot more out of it reading Exodus. Um, 
and reading it, of course, with students so that we would read it slowly, line by line, and um, see what it could teach us. Tell us a little more about that method. You, you, you call it reading philosophically here. For, for a reader who's new to this approach, well, I think one of the most striking things about the book at first would be the mode, the method, the way of treating the biblical text. How, how would you describe your approach to it? Well, I mean, to begin with, I would say I read this book um, for better and for worse, the way I would read any great text. I try to suspend my own judgments and disbelief. I assume that it's a, it's a book that's been put together by a, by a superior intelligence who, if I submit to what it might have to show me, I might learn something of immense importance that I would have never learned if I didn't sort of uh, suspend my judgment, and in this case, my skepticism and disbelief, and uh, read it carefully, uh, read it. Uh, in, in, what I mean by philosophical is read it to find out its wisdom, to, to, to assume that it has something important to say about things that matter, not just to me, but that have always mattered. And to read slowly, uh, to treat um, as if every word counted, as if the silences were invitations to speculation, as if the juxtapositions had to be explained. Um, and to, this is the hardest thing to do with a book about which one begins with so many presuppositions, to try to forget what you think might be in this book and not to import it or not to read it through the lens of my own concepts, but to let it teach me how it wants to be read. And that's not an easy thing to do. And you have to do it many times and try to purge the notions that you bring from it. And um, the more I did that, I think the more I was able to see. Hmm. So you, you divide the book into, you divide your book into three parts, uh, taking up Exodus in what seem like roughly it's three parts, what you call slavery and deliverance, which takes us from the beginning to about the splitting of the sea, uh, covenant and law, which of course takes us through the Ten Commandments and the ordinances, and worship and presence, which takes us through the golden calf and the building of the tabernacle to the end of Exodus. I want to ask you some about each of those, but more broadly, you suggest at the opening that these aren't just the three thematic parts of the book of Exodus. They're, they're maybe the three things that it takes to make a nation. Um, help us understand that point a little. Yeah, look, this, this is one of the things I learned from this book. And in fact, I, I read it uh, to begin with as if there were really only sort of two things that made a nation. I, I read it uh, that you have this national story of slavery and deliverance. And then you have the giving of the law, which sets out the guiding principles for a way of life. And I sort of shortchanged all the stuff on the tabernacle. Most of it's very boring, detailed instructions about how to build it, detailed account of how you build it according to the instructions. And we can get into that later. But um, by taking the whole thing seriously and doing due diligence finally on the last part, it seems to me that we have here not just three historical moments in this narrative account of the beginning of the Israelite nation, but we have three things that might be important for any nation. Um, first of all, a shared national story, a shared national history celebrated in story and in song, and you get it here uh, complete in the first part. Second, you have a, um, a covenantal founding or you have a, a founding constituting uh, uh, event entered into by consent of the governed um, in which lays out a teaching for a way of life, not just criminal law and torts to deal with um, um, mutual wrongdoing amongst human beings, but also morality, uh, teachings of not just constraint, but encouragement and even uplift um, and a way of life that um, ultimately points to producing excellent human beings and citizens. Um, and by the way, a way of this, although the law was given by God, it was a law under which they would govern themselves once they arrived 
in the promised land. So this is a law for self-government. And then finally, um, to um, beyond law and governance of daily life, something that answers to the human aspiration to be in touch with something higher than ourselves. Um, uh, an aspiration which is expressed by human beings in all kinds of ways, uh, begun with Cain, with Noah, one sees this as a kind of natural impulse to be in touch with the powers that be, um, and that those impulses need an expression uh, in ways that are constructive rather than destructive. And you build a community also, not just around law and mores, but around about ritual in which people to gather together to encounter the presence of that to which they look up. And uh, it's an interesting question whether uh, a nation that um, whose national story is contested, not to say despised, uh, whose moral fabric is frayed, if not in tattered, and um, has a hard time defining its national purpose in relation to things that are higher, whether that nation will consider to flourish. If you see such a nation in the mirror, it's a question for us. Yeah, certainly a, 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 exactly a question which I, I wanna get. And maybe by way of thinking a little bit through each of these three parts as we find them, we, we at, at the outset of Exodus, we find the Israelites becoming enslaved in Egypt. And Egypt isn't just where they happen to be. Um, what, what, what is Egypt in the biblical narrative as you understand it? What is it that, that is enslaving them? And that in a sense, the rest of this narrative is defined against, and in some ways, the nation is defined against at the end of this. Yeah, that, that's very good. Um, look, uh, two things about this. I'll concentrate on the Egypt part, but I wanna say something about, there are lots of ways uh, political philosophers have described the foundation of a nation some kind of organic growth from village to town to city or by conquest uh, or um, uh, social contracts and so on. Uh, the Almighty chose to start this nation with people enslaved and enslaved in Egypt. And I wanna say a word about why begin in slavery. It has a couple of advantages which are exploited here. First of all, the people are emptied out of everything that they knew and were before, which means they are a kind of blank slate on which a new way of life can be inscribed. That's very important. Second, they have a kind of common enemy. Third, they, they will know to whom they owe for their deliverance, and they will enter the world with something of a spirit of gratitude. Um, fourth, they will remember in their narrative, once we were enslaved, and it's hoped that that remembrance, and they're reminded of it constantly, remember you were slaves in Egypt, that they will remember to treat the stranger as a member of our common humanity and to be kind to strangers and to be compassionate to those who are on the outside. And, and then um, finally, because this is in Egypt and it gets to your question, they will learn the leading way of life um, like which one should not be. Israel is to be anti-Egypt. By the way, it's also to be anti-Mesopotamian and anti-Canaanites. And um, I want maybe at some point to come back to that. There are three uh, big alternatives in the ancient Near East. Egypt is the preeminent one for our purposes now. But those three ancient alternatives are not just ancient alternatives. They have modern representatives. Mm -hmm. Egypt is here. Egypt is here and it's waiting in the wings if, uh, if we fail. What's Egypt? Egypt is first of all uh, a land that um, on the face of it looks to nature and lines up with nature the Nile to which it owes its fertility, the sun which it worships as a god. All kinds of natural powers are celebrated and worshiped or feared in human life. The crocodile, the scarab, the bull, etc., etc. 
But um, e Egypt is not altogether happy with nature because Egypt is obsessed with decay and mortality. The magicians are working very, very hard to um, uh, defeat decay and ultimately death. All those pharaohs in the pyramids uh, are embalmed waiting for the secret to be discovered so that they can be reanimated. Um, and that pre preoccupation with uh, conquering mortality is the enemy of thinking about life as the continuity of generations and the transmission of a way of life. Mortality, not morality, is a big deal in Egypt. Um, the next thing is um, Egypt is a technocracy and an administrative state. Partly Joseph helped institute this. Um, that, uh, and I should say, by the way, the, the worship of nature um, goes along with, and it's polytheism, goes along with, um, it does not have a view that the human being has a very high place in the order of things. We don't have anything like the biblical view that man alone among the creatures is in the image of God, is the God-like creature. So, um, you don't have any teaching there that would lead people to respect the elementary and shared human dignity, but rather what rules there is one man who rules as if he were a god and is so regarded. So you have a technocracy, which also goes along with a certain despotism, and there is no rule of law that applies to all. Um, that's, um, that is presented really as the alternative. Um, and it's made explicitly the alternative. Let me just add this, although it's a little out of, out of order. When, when they come to Sinai and the beginning of the 10 commandments, God says, uh, I, I, he's, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And that's a true fact. And it's that, it's that on the basis of which he means to establish their relation. Um, I have been your benefactor. But philosophically read, it suggests, look, you've got two alternatives, human beings. You're going to live in relation to me and a teaching that I'm going to be offering you for your benefit. The other alternative you've just seen. Those are the two colossal human alternatives. To stand in relation to a God um, who is going to give you tools of governance for your own good or to ultimately live at the behest of a human being who behaves as a god without regard for your well-being. We're There's so much there to pick up on and we'll get to a lot of it I think but in the process of the kind of formation of nationhood that happens to get them out of this bondage we find the necessity of a different model of leadership if, if Pharaoh is the example of the despot who sees himself as a god, we're given a different example. We're given this man, Moses, who is at the human center of this book um, and who we follow from birth through an amazingly dramatic set of transformations. Why is this the man to lead them out? Who is this Moses? Look, this is a question of questions and it's, um... There are enduring mysteries about him. Um, Moses is an Israelite, uh, born to the spirited tribe of, of, of Levi. He's adopted by his mother, looked upon him and saw that he was good. Um, the only other time of which that's been said has been said by God of various things in the, in the creation. So Moses is already seen by his mother in, in language that echoes something grand when we first meet him. He's brought into Pharaoh's house and the text goes dead silent on us. He spends, I'm guessing, 17 to 20 years in Pharaoh's house. And the question of questions is what education did he get in Pharaoh's house? What did he learn? This is not just Spartacus, a leader of a slave revolt. He's had a princely education. I imagine he was taught to ride the chariot and to shoot the bow, but I want to know what he studied. Um, he must have studied mathematics. He might have been led into the arcana of, of, of what the, the, the wise men uh, of the palace knew. But um, 
he was probably also studying the Egyptian version of first things. Um, and then he comes out of the house for the first time you meet him. And he has these three episodes which show him to be a spirited man filled with fellow feeling, a defender of the underdog. He smites the Egyptian taskmaster who's beating up a Hebrew. He tries to break a fight between two Hebrews unsuccessfully. He runs off to Midian um, and he rescues Pharaoh, uh, Jethro's daughters from the bullies at the well. Um, and he tends his father-in-law's sheep, Jethro's sheep, when all of a sudden in, a, in the massive transformative moment, he sees a burning bush. And Moses goes to look at this burning bush in order to see why it has not been consumed. None of the patriarchs asked why. Moses is a spirited man. He's a passionate man. He has a sense of righteous indignation at the sight of, of bullying and injustice. But Moses has a philosophical bent. Moses wants to know the causes of things. And it comes out in the conversation with God that he wants to know his name. I, Moses wants to know not just who you are, but what you are. And that desire to know the ultimate thing. He's told, he's told, I'm the God of your father and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he says, uh, look, um, when I come to the people and they say, who sent you? What shall I say? Well, that's a question he wants to know for himself. And he gets a non-answer. I will be what I will be. And it satisfies him for now, but later on, he's going to ask again. Moses is, um, I mean, if we were reading a different book, Moses looks like he could be a philosopher king in somebody else's account. Um, but it turns out he's not. It turns out he gets a kind of education on the job, and he walks around his life with this voice in his head who guides him and eventually leads him to take certain initiatives once he understands the direction of the program. Mm. Um, I say one more thing to begin with, but it, one has to follow this. Moses is a reluctant leader. He doesn't want this job. He says, look, um, you're gonna do all these things for these people, what do you need me for? Who am I to do this? Um, but he takes the job for reasons that are hard to be clear about. He must have also some ambition in this, or he might think that maybe this is the destiny. He, he's out there tending the sheep and waiting for some call to explain what's this all about. He has some kind of longings, but he has, he has no real regard for this people. He looks down on them. They're constantly murmuring against him. They want to stone him. He complains to God about them. And for the longest time, he never calls them my people, and he never says we. He calls them your people or that people. And one of the great motions of the book is to see when it does it happen that Moses finally identifies with the flock. And when offered an opportunity to destroy them and start over with himself as leader, he turns it down and owns up to being simply one of them. And that's just stunning. So the career of Moses is one of the, the unfolding career. And, and um, he turns out to be a poet. I mean, he sings the song after the sing. He, he, he's, he's fantastic. And what makes him the way he is, is one of the great mysteries to be pondered in the text. He's a giant. What he what he leads the people to we, we've we, we naturally think of as a liberation. They are being liberated out of bondage, and the 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 scenes of liberation are glorious. And liberty and freedom are certainly at the heart of the promise of this book in a lot of ways. But what is this idea of freedom? What is the liberation into which Exodus promises uh, a, a, a path? What does freedom mean? Actually, um, if you look at the text, the word freedom doesn't occur. Mm -hmm. Hebrew words for freedom don't occur. This event of Exodus has been taken as an inspiration to various movements of national liberation, which not wrongly, but it's very surprising that uh, 
the, it, it's described as redemption. It's described as deliverance from bondage, the opposite of which you would think would be non-bondage. But it's described actually as a summons to service. And some of my students say, ah, the Israelites, they've just changed one form of servitude for another because it's the same word that's used. God says they will come and serve me on this mountain. Avodah, it's, it's, it's service. And that's what they had. So the question becomes, um, well, part of the question is to figure out what's the difference between serving God and serving Pharaoh? And how is serving God, in fact, uh, how does it add up to being a form of self-rule? How does it add up to being not only self-rule and not being ruled by other human beings? How does it add up to being lived under the rule of law in which everybody is equal, but also how to be taught to um, govern some of the unruly passions that make you a slave from within. Um, fear, greed, envy, pride, despair, all based upon a certain kind of misunderstanding of the world. Um, so that there is a way in which the people are being moved to what we would call freedom, not the freedom of indetermination, not the freedom of doing as you please, but the freedom of self-governance uh, under the law that's been divinely given and to which we have consented. I mean, it's very important. They've made this offer, they consented three times, probably not knowing what they were consenting to at first, but gradually, gradually. So this is a law offered, accepted, but it is a law which liberates them from certain enslaving forces within and provides for a way of life in which they can live together and aspire to be, to fulfill the promise that is inherent in man's being the only among the creatures who bears the divine image. So this is a, a, a liberation into and through law, as you say, and that can take us into the second of the three themes that you that you divide the book into. How do we think about this law? Why the Ten Commandments? What does the nature of the ordinances tell us about law? What's the purpose of law in the formation of this nation? Um, I would say uh, before we do the law, there's something prior to the law which is indispensable. And that's the idea of covenant. And covenant is very different from contract or social contract. A contract is a transactional relation in which uh, uh, I get something, you get something. If I don't like it, uh, I dissolve it. You can sue me for breach of contract. A covenant is a binding uh, between two parties that absent this covenant wouldn't have anything to do with each other. And it is a form in which each dedicates themselves to the fulfillment of that for the sake of which they've entered into a covenant. And what's astounding is that this collection of ex-slaves who having seen the deliverance, having been given a song to sing about how they escaped the pursuing Egyptians at the Sea of Reeds and have been sung courageous and fend for themselves are brought finally to this mountain and are offered a deal. I've, they're offered a deal. If you will heed my words, my voice and keep my covenant, you will be to me a treasure amongst the peoples of the earth, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And what's on offer here, this group of ex-slaves who to this moment have not thought of themselves as a people. They've not thought of themselves as anything but these bedraggled uh, and oppressed, newly delivered people are allowed to imagine a national purpose for themselves. A national purpose for themselves. God knows what they would make of kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We have a lot of time, we have a lot of trouble trying to figure that out ourselves. But they're given a vision of possibility and they embrace it unknowingly, even before the, what you say will do, okay? Then it gets spelled out. 
And then what you have are in the Ten Commandments, you have what I would what I would call something, it functions in this community like the preamble to the Constitution. What's being enunciated here are not, it's not a rule book, but they're the embodiments of the guiding principles of this community, after which you will get a bunch of ordinances that fill out some of these principles in certain select areas. But um, those principles are, um, some of them overlap things that would have been in other legal codes like the Code of Hammurabi and, and others in the neighborhood, but others are absolutely new. And they are the guiding principles of this new way of life that is meant to um, not only curtail evils, but to lift up the human possibility. And two of them, I think, are for me um, just stunning. And I think they're worth a few minutes. Um, the Yes, there is the injunction against idol worship and, and so on, and the prescriptions of murder, adultery, theft, et cetera, et cetera. But there are two positive commandments, keeping the Sabbath day, remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy and honor your father and mother. Those two positive commandments are unique. Those are the unique um, things of this, this picture and um, they go very far to being anti-Egyptian and being foundational for a humane and egalitarian um, and um, dignified uh, way of life. So the people have been given this great gift. They have accepted it. They're coming to see themselves as having a special place but while they wait for Moses to come down with the with the the ordinances, they lose their patience. They turn to idolatry. Um, how, how do you understand that urge to idolatry? Look, um, this story is always told. I have always heard it as. I, I, I should say. Let me let me back off slightly. Um, you asked earlier about the method of reading. I try very hard and increasingly have tried to imagine myself in the story, not only reading about it and not only allowing it to work on me, but to allow it to work on me by imagining myself in the place of all of the characters, including Pharaoh and including the people uh, that you've now alluded to who are waiting below when Moses is up on the mountain getting instructions for the building of the tabernacle. And uh, it's usually, that story is usually told with some embarrassment here. These people have just talked to God. Um, they've just said yes to this covenant that's just been ratified. And Moses gone for, you know, 40 days and um, gone and forgotten. And they can't do without some kind of new idol. And they ask Aaron to build a calf. Well, it's an embarrassment. And but um, two things. First of all, you got to sympathize with them. Moses, of this invisible power, they have vague inklings. When God spoke to them on the mountain of the Ten Commandments, they stood afar off and it said, and the people saw the thunder. They don't, they, their senses are so overwhelmed. I doubt that they heard a word. They're terrified. They say, Moses, you speak to us lest we die. So their access to everything, their access to divine power is Moses. Moses walks into the cloud. He didn't tell them I'm only going to be 40 days and 40 nights. Moses is up there enjoying his conversation with God. God is keeping him up there so that this could possibly take place. So we'll find out. He goes into the fire. The people think the fire has consumed them. He's not coming back. What are we to do here? It's the desert. And it's, we need some kind of assistance. So they plead with Aaron, make someone who will go before us and who will lead us. And, um, it's a mistake, but it's not an unintelligible mistake. And 
the people are expressing their need for being in touch with the powers that be. They're confused about who the powers that be might be. They're lapsing in a way to Egyptian worship in which the bull is a symbol of virility um, and, and, and power. And um, look, uh, I read this very unorthodoxly. Um, the covenant as given told them all kinds of good things that would happen if they kept it. There wasn't anything said about what will happen if you break it, and if you break it foundationally by practicing idolatry and rejecting the foundation of the whole new order. Sooner or later, one has to find out, the people have to find out, everybody has to find out, the reader has to find out what's going to happen if they try to dissolve this covenant. God arranges for them to take the gold and silver from the Egyptians, so they're going to have it in their possession. There are two alternatives. We're going to either build the tabernacle that I'm giving you rules for, or you're going to do something else with it and build your own uh, image or your own likeness. I think uh, what you find out from building this calf is absolutely stunning. They build this calf and Moses is forced to plead with God not to destroy this people. And in a conversation that is, and I think, by the way, it's a setup. I think God wants Moses to plead for these people. In the end, he comes down, he purifies the camp at great cost, he owns them. And because he's been given a certain partial revelation, and this is crucial, he learns that God is not just a man of war, and he's not just a provider of mana in the desert, but he's willing to forgive even the greatest transgression if there is repentance and a desire for turning around. And it's on that basis that the people are forgiven that they're in fact willing to take on the onus of aiming high, of aiming high. And now when he tells them to build the tabernacle, they're wildly enthusiastic, wildly enthusiastic. And what you have then is a, is a home for exactly those passions to be in touch with what's highest, in which those longings can be expressed, but now under direction and communally and not orgiastically, but with gratitude. Yeah, let's let's that's extraordinary. And let's think about that tabernacle. I would say for me, maybe the newest thing in the book is this question of the tabernacle. The the, uh, the uh, until then, Exodus is an extraordinarily dramatic book. It's maybe the most dramatic book there is. It's full of stories that every child would know. There's an evil king and there's a baby on the river and a burning bush and plagues and pillar of fire, lightning and thunder. And then we run into this section of multiple chapters of what seem like maybe directions for building furniture or something. Yep. It's, it's, uh, it's a hard stop. What's, what's going on there? Um, it, it is, as you say, um, if, you're, if, if you anticipate that the people will have um, both what the Greeks would call Dionysiac impulses and Apollonian longings, the first for a kind of wild, exuberant, ecsta ecstatic expression uh, and merging with each other and with everything else, that, by the way, is the Canaanite model, or the love of visible beauty and aestheticism, um, that one saw in the uh, episode with the elders just a little before, um, then you're going to have, you can't extirpate these desires in the human soul, but you can redirect them. Uh, you can redirect them by putting them under measure. That's why all that mathematical stuff and detailed precision. You build a house to cabin, instruct, and redirect those impulses. And, um, uh, and when you look at the house and you look at this house and you say, who is the architect? Well, uh, you don't say Frank Lloyd Wright or I am pay. It was the Almighty who gave the instructions. This is built according to rule. Um, the artists uh, who previously were incapable of making idols and being idolaters and celebrating themselves are here brought into the process as the handymen 
and, 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 and their genius is put into the service of this. I originally thought, I originally thought that the tabernacle was in fact a concession to human weakness, that these passions would erupt anyhow. They erupted, they erupted after, after the flood and Noah offers up animal sacrifices and God's comment on, Adam, on Noah's sacrifices. I'll never again curse the ground for man's sake for the imagination of his heart is evil from his youth. Noah takes some of his animal roommates and without instruction makes an offering because he wants to be in touch with what's on high and he hasn't been told how. So I thought it was those impulses, but there's more to it than that. There's really more to it than that. This is a cooperative building project in which the human beings and God join together in partnership to build a place where the text says, God says of himself, he has taken up with Israel for one reason and one reason only, that they shall know him and that he shall abide among them. The understanding is that, the, that human life in its restlessness can't be completed until human beings have the experience of, in their daily life, some kind of sense that they're communing with or in touch with what's highest. So that this is a place which really makes possible through ritual, through communal gathering in a place very carefully defined in which the human beings, um, instead of building Babel, this time they build the answer to Babel or the answer to Pharaoh's cities that they built for him. Here they build a place which partly by their own construction, but partly under direction, will have a place where they can have something like some glimpse of what it would mean to have an encounter with God. Mm. And that's, that's astounding. That's absolutely astounding. And, you know, in a sense, it takes us back to the beginning and this idea of the three elements of nationhood. Is this third element essential for nationhood? And what does that say to us? Do we need a common religion, a common connection to the divine as a nation in order to be a nation? Uh, tough problem. Um, uh, we have to be careful. The world has seen a lot of what happens with theocratic politics and militant religion aligned with politics uh, is, is a blood sport. And on the other hand, we've seen uh, in the last century, what godless politics looks like too. And it's destroyed more lives and maimed more human beings. Uh, I'm thinking of Hitler, Stalin and Mao than all of the religious wars together. Uh, if we wanna talk about us, uh, I'm still with Tocqueville um, in the wonderful chapter on the point of departure of the Americans where he marvels that in the in the Americas, that, that in the United States, the spirit of liberty and the spirit of religion are not only both alive and, and not hostile to each other, but they each reinforce each other and need each other. Um, I don't think America has a national religious purpose uh, in that sense, though the Constitution is. Um, not indifferent um, to the presence or absence of religion. No, we have religious toleration uh, because the founders knew religious persecution or the, the colonists knew religious persecution, but we protect in the first of our rights, the free expression of religion. And I think it was widely thought that not necessarily in politics, but with respect to culture, mores, all kinds of other things and in society, the spirit of religion was indispensable to having a self-governing people um, uh, who, who then would be fit to govern themselves politically as well. Um, whether we have, whether one could say the nation has a national meaning and purpose that we can celebrate ritually, not necessarily in the common church, but through our holy, day, holy days, um, which used to be places for 
reinvigorating the national aspirations. Um, and they've now, alas, become three days mattress day sales. Um, we have an opportunity, we, I think, are in danger of losing some sense of what it is that we as a nation can aspire to. It won't be the same thing as Israel, but culturally speaking, uh, the, teachings of, the teachings of the Bible uh, still have, I think, something important to offer us, not only as a, an an analogy, but even in some of their content. Let me follow from that into one of the questions we've gotten from the audience, and it is time to turn to those. And we have really an embarrassment of riches in these questions. I, I already in advance can apologize for not getting to them all. But let me start with a question that picks up right where you've just left off, a, crush, a question from Paul Ludwig, who asks, uh, I'll just read his question to you. W would you prefer to have lived under the regime in Exodus, been a citizen of ancient Israel, or did liberal democracy make any improvements on the regime that comes out of Exodus in theory or in practice? Improvements that might be worth our appreciating and keeping. For everybody else, I know Paul Ludwig and his mischievous ways. It's a wonderful question, Paul. Thank you very much. Look, um, I know my history. I know where I would have been in the history of the world. Um, I'm blessed beyond belief to be living um, in post-World War II America. Um, I'll, I'll refrain from commenting upon um, whether the direction is stable, up or down. I'll leave that to you to think about. And whether if it's up, stable, or down, it has something to do with the status of the presence of this book in our midst. Um, but uh, no, um, in all kinds of ways, it's much better to be alive in the, I'm almost going to say 20th century, in the 21st century um, than uh, anywhere prior in the history of the world. But it's a question. It's a question. Can we really allow our reliance on um, technological progress, economic prosperity, and pursuing our private share of, of of, 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 of wealth and our personal view of happiness. Um, can we rely on that to take the place of having a shared story and having a strong moral foundation in our social and communal life? And um, thinking, that, um, thinking that there is some reason why we here are a nation with some good to do in the world? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. So yeah, look, um, I mean, part of the difficulty is um, most good things come at some price. Um, and uh, if you don't know that there's a price, you can't even begin to work to ameliorate it. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm quite concerned about where the balance has gone on this subject. Let me follow on that with a question that combines a few questions from the audience, but on the same theme, I mentioned at the outset that you now have a role at Shalem College in Jerusalem. You spend some of your time in Israel every year. And not only that, but you, you taught Exodus to Israeli students in the process of coming to the arguments of this book. And several people have asked what that has meant for your reading of the text. Did the experience of teaching the book in Israel to Hebrew speaking students uh, give you a different perspective on the text, some different insights that you might not have had other ones. Look, that's very welcome. And it gives me a chance to, I think there are even a couple of these people uh, on this, uh, on this, uh, on the Zoom, um, immensely grateful for that, for that opportunity to, um, to do that. This was a remarkable experience, it was 2016. Um, they're reading the text in Hebrew. I'm teaching from Robert Alter's translation. Not all of them can express their thoughts in, in, in English. So I say, you speak in Hebrew, somebody will translate. It was very frustrating for everybody. They were very gracious in indulging my way of reading um, the text. Uh, there were traditional readers. There were people who had no use for the Bible. About 25 of us. Um, but the whole time I'm teaching this class, I can't shake this feeling. Here I am in my uh, eighth decade of life. 
I have the privilege of teaching the founding text of the Jewish people to a group of the most admirable and noble young people, all of them done their national service in the land of Israel revived after 2000 years of dispersion, kept alive only because the law of Moses had kept them alive during those 2000 years um, and doing it in Jerusalem. I, I, I just had the shivers thinking about this. How, how, and I would say to myself, you know, even an atheist would have to wonder about whether this wasn't some kind of a miracle. Um, it, it, I, the, I, the epigraph to the book is a passage from Rousseau, not never published, but I found it in the writings of Rabbi Sachs, the late um, lamented Rabbi Sachs. Rousseau basically says, "Look, the Jews are a wonder. Um, the the law of the law of Numa, the law of of of, of Lycurgus, the law of Solon are gone, um, but the law of Moses remains, even though the people don't have a land." He suggests that there might be more political wisdom in these teachings uh, than in the teachings of Rome and Greece combined. Um, I discovered that after the book was written, I liked it. But that's um, the durability of this teaching, the durab that the people lived according to this teaching. And they've not exactly inherited the theocracy that was there and the temple hasn't been rebuilt and it's a heterogeneous country and it's got liberal strands and democratic strands and there are minorities present and it's a complicated political problem. But the spirit of the past is alive there and one can feel it. Hmm. Our friend Alan Rubenstein asked a question about in a sense, this, this matter of whether this is a book for Israel or a book for the world. He asked, how do you think about the national and universal purposes of the text? Is this a text written by Israelites to explain their national character to their children? And to that extent, is there a limit to the insight that might be found in it for people outside of that particular national story? Um, that's also very welcome. Thank you, Alan. Um, look, uh, it is obviously uh, a text that has been appropriated um, by a particular people, but one also has to say not only for the Jews, but it is the Old Testament and is, uh, has been embraced and increasingly by, by Christians. In fact, the, the New Testament is the new covenant, doesn't abrogate the old one, but in a way builds on top of it. Um, and its teachings have in fact, uh, largely through Christianity spread through the world, uh, influenced very much of the, uh, of the world to this day, even in places where that influence is not acknowledged. Um, but um, internal to the text, there are all kinds of evidence that suggest that God's way with Israel is not meant just parochially. He says when he calls Abraham to beginning, he says, and in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. He's previously decided to, he previously tried to work with all humankind united, but it backfired. So he decides to start with one people, but to build a kind of toehold in the world for his teaching that would then be born by Israel as a witness for the world at large. And late in Deuteronomy, Moses basically says to the people, um, this is your wisdom in the eyes of the world. When the people see what you've been taught here, see your laws, they will say, this is a wise and, 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 and goodly nation. Um, this is, um, I mean, the question of what it means to be a kingdom of priests and whether they're supposed to proselytize or whether they're just an example to be looked to and a witness, it, it's complicated. But I think there's no question that the intention here is not parochial and that the teachings are presented here, not it, the teachings are presented to this people, but they have a universal, they have a universal character. They have a universal character. And that's partly what I mean when I say, you read it for its philosophical wisdom. And by the way, um, political philosophers, 16th, 17th, 18th centuries read the book for its political wisdom and got stuff out of it, even though they didn't accept the law as being binding on them as the Jews would have. So um, 
I don't, I don't think this is an imposition. I think it's, I think the text itself says that its wisdom is not parochial. Hmm. Let me pick up on that and we're getting to our final minutes here too. So I'll draw on one more question from the audience, but also combine that with my own question of where to end up. Gary Schmidt asks this question, is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and second inaugural, his effort to create an American tabernacle? to build for us a way to come together around this way of looking up. And I would only add to that, what, what would you say to Americans now looking to this book for wisdom about our complicated situation? Uh, how can it speak to the needs we plainly have today? Those are two different questions. Let I me think Lincoln connects them, but I, Lincoln we can see. Um, gosh, uh, this is so welcome and um, the Lincoln Memorial is my favorite place in America. It may be my favorite public building anywhere. And I feel in the Lincoln Memorial um, that I'm in touch with the best of America. Um, and it's thanks to the words that are on the wall. Um, and thanks to Lincoln's having given forethought from a very early age about the problem of how to attach the people to the country now that the founding generation has gone to rest. This is the great Lyceum address written when he's only 28, given when he's only 28 years old, in which he says that reverence for the law has to become the political religion of America now that people are inclined to take the law into their own hands uh, and, um, and that he doesn't say this is a, be a substitute for biblical religion that you will practice in your own way, but for the nation as a whole, one needs something more. Um, it, to begin with, Lincoln seemed to talk about that these would be the products of cold calculating reason, but I think that that concern of his about the political religion of the nation uh, occupied him for his life. And I think that those two speeches were crafted to become part of the canonical texts of American political religion. They certainly function that way or did. Um, and uh, they, anybody, anybody who comes to town and who's willing, I take to the Lincoln Memorial and we stand there and we read both speeches and we talk about them. And then I sit there with, and I look with Lincoln and I look out over the picture of the country today and I only imagine him weeping. Um, I think, um, uh, I think that, well, if, if, you should get Diana Schaub to talk about Lincoln. She, she's much better on this than I am. But I think that Lyceum address should be um, read in every schoolhouse right now. Um, uh, but we're talking about the Bible. I would think that part of the difficulty, look, part of the difficulty of reading the Bible is almost nobody reads it as a book. The scholars have dissolved it into the sources from which it was put together, and they use it to study the mindset of an ancient people or the various pieces that made up its voices. And that's not uninteresting, but it deprives us of seeing what would the author of this who, or the redactor who put it all together want us to get from it if we were to live with this and not just learn about it, but learn from it, okay? Um, and the people for whom this book is sacred sort of pick things out of it that speak to them and lead to certain laws, but they don't read it as a mirror in which we can think about the en enduring questions of what's a good life, what's a good community, what's the relation between law and freedom, between justice and something more than justice, and what's the purpose of our being here in this community. Reading that book in this spirit, I think, can help. Well, that is a wonderful place to end and, a, and a, a wonderful invitation to enter into this book. And it does bring us to the end of our time. Leon Cass, thank you very much for joining me for this conversation. And thank you for this wonderful book. And thanks to all of you for joining and watching. The, this conversation, I think, has given you a little flavor of what is here. But I cannot recommend enough reading the book, thinking it, uh, thinking it through, learning from it. It has so much to teach us. 
we had enough questions left to make for another hour. So I do apologize to those who asked wonderful questions that we didn't get to ask. Uh, but the book is there for you and there are many answers in it. Thank you all and have a wonderful week. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you all.